Yeah. Hi there. So, um, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about compiling higher order specifications to SMT solvers. Um, I should say that this talk is not actually remote. I am actually 10 floors above you in the, in the building, and I have um, positive test for COVID, so that's why I'm giving the talk here. And thank you for the organizers for um, uh, letting me sort of talk um, remotely at short notice. So as, as um, <clears throat> was mentioned, uh, this is joint work with Matthew Daggett, uh, Katya Komodanska, uh, Wen Cocker, and Luca Arnabaldi. So the goal of this work is to translate high level specifications to SMT solvers with good error messages and guaranteed semantic preservation. So really our motivation is a language we're developing called vehicle for specifying neural networks. So it's a high level language with higher order functions and dependent types, and it allows you to write arbitrary properties. And the reason we want to write arbitrary properties is because we have multiple backends. So the one I'm going to talk about in this talk is um, SMT-like solvers, such as Marabu for verifying properties. So Marabu is a specialized solver for proving things about neural networks. But also we have a backend um, that generates Agda code so that we can use these properties of neural networks in larger proofs. So if you have a controller which is using a neural network component and you know some property of that neural network, you can use that to write a proof in Agda that the whole system uh, supports some property. And we also have a backend for lost functions for training with built-in constraints. And the point here is that these um, uh, backends all have different constraints on what kinds of properties you can use. So we don't want to a priori um, restrict the properties that you can write in vehicle. We want to <laughs> use it to, in principle, be able to write any property they can like in vehicle, but then to work out um, at um, compile time, if you like, or uh, specifying time, um, <coughs> what we're, if the property is suitable for the back end. So in particular, this talk is about translating to SMT. And to translate to SMT solver from this high level language requires some work. So obviously the property needs to be within the subset handled by the solver. So it's, uh, um, in this case, it's only going to involve uh, linear constraints and no quantifier alternation. Any higher order functions need to be reduced away. And features like uninterpreted functions, which is what's used by Marabu to stand for the neural network being analyzed, and things like if then else, which are just nice for writing specifications, these need to be translated specially. And also, we'd like to be confident the translation is correct. So that's what we do in this um, <coughs> work, <coughs> is to work out how to translate to an SMT solver by finding out if the sub specification you've written is within the subset, and then having a proved correct um, translation. So first, I'm going to show you the vehicle high-level specification language, or an example. So here's um, an example of a short specification written in vehicle. So first, we have a type <laughs> uh, input, which is the inputs to our very small neural network. So let's say that's a vector of five real numbers. Then we have our uninterpreted function, which might, may stand in neural network later on, which is f, which takes an input and gives you a real number. So it's some kind of classification thing. <coughs> <laughs> and then the rest of the functions define um, uh, a monotonicity property. So we have to, for this um, equal except at says that um, given some index between zero and uh, four, so an index into an array of length five, then we say the two inputs are equal except at that input. <coughs> and then the monotonic property says for any two inputs, if they're equal except at uh, location two, and location two in the first one is less than or equal to location two in the second one, then um, applying the network to those um, two inputs should give you something which is, uh, again, less than or equal. So this network is then going to be monotonic um, in, this, in the second component or the number, the third component of the, um, of the input. And when we actually give that to an SMT solver, it looks like this. So we have to reduce everything down. We get a bunch of equalities that admittedly could be simplified away. And then we say that Z1 is equal to the output of the first instantiation, Z2 is equal to the output of the second instantiation, and then the outputs have this property. And again, and X2 and X, uh, Y2 have the right property. <coughs> so that was an example of a, um, a specification which can be um, translated, but also if you have a high level language, it's very easy to make specifications which can't be translated. So we have this uh, in-range thing here at the top that takes a real and gives you a boolean. 
And given it's um, uh, an interpreted function f, um, so <laughs> Um, says that there is an x which um, maps um, f maps to that y. So somehow y is in the range of f. And then we can use that um, modularly to write some specification, like 0 and 1 are in the range, so in range 0 and in range 1. But it's, <laughs> it's very easy to accidentally introduce mixed quantifiers. So we could say we want to, um, our neural network to be subjective, which is not, not, never going to happen, but um, we could specify that with for all y in range y. And then obviously this would not be translatable to an SMT solver because it involves a for all exists uh, kind of query. So in summary, to translate to a solver, we have to avoid nonlinear um, constraints and mixed quantifiers. But we need to translate away higher order functions and nested function applications, or so that's function applications uh, for the uninterpreted function nested within uh, linear constraints and if then else's. So the way we're going to do this is in two phases. One is to um, identify uh, <coughs> um, uh, the, the kind of property that's being specified in the specification by some kind of analysis. And then once we've done that, and assuming it succeeded, we will then translate it um, down to the level of the SMT solver. So the analysis target we're going to use is a more richly typed language um, than the one I've shown you so far. <coughs> <laughs> so the key idea, really, is to annotate types of information about what kind of properties they describe. So a real number, previously, was just a plain type, but now we're going to annotate it with a linearity annotation, which is either constant, linear, or nonlinear. And this tells us, um, for our value of type real L, for instance, that means it depends linearly on um, uh, its free variables. Similarly, for booleans, that's going to be our property type, we have a linearity and a polarity. So linearity tells us what kinds of constraints are used within this property. And the polarity tells us what kinds of quantification are used. And here we have got a rich language of unquantified ones with u. We have universally quantified ones, existentially quantified ones, uh, what we've called parallel quantification, which is where we have... Um, uh, conjunctive combinations of properties which can either have be purely universal or purely existential and then we have alternating ones where we do um, genuinely mix the um, for all and exists and so we annotate um, our types with these things to tell us um, <coughs> what what kind of property it is but the crucial point is that we don't want the user to ever see these annotations this is part of our internal analysis to work out whether or not a um, specification can be compiled and also note we do not disallow nonlinear or mixed quantifiers, uh, nonlinear properties or mixed quantifiers. We're just going to note that they are used. <coughs> the second part of the target language is that the um, operators now have very rich types. So, for instance, the um, plus on numbers says for three different linearities, um, if the maximum of L1 and L2 is L3, and we take a real number which is annotated with a linearity L1, a real number annotated with linearity L2, then we'll get a real number annotated with linearity L3. And similarly for multiplication, but we have a different uh, ternary relation between the operators then. And again, for um, <coughs> uh, less than or equal constraints, we take two real numbers and we gener <coughs> generate, I'm sorry, this would be L3, uh, Boolean L3 with no um, uh, quantification. And then for the logic, we have AND combination, that uh, tells us how the um, linearity and polarities combine uh, to get the results. And then this for all is quite a complex one because we have this has for all constraint, which allows us to mix for alls over um, real variables, but also for alls over finite collections, which is one of the things we used in the uh, monotonicity example. And then what we're going to do is use type class resolution rules to provide evidence. Um, so for the max lin and mole lin, there's a bunch of fixed um, uh, rules. So for instance, multiplying two constants gives you a constant. Multiplying constant by linear gives you linear. Multiplying linear by constant gives you linear, and so on. Multiplying two linears um, <coughs> gets you nonlinear. And for quantification, uh, we have rules like if we want to uh, um, uh, quantify over reals, then that real is going to be a linear one because obviously it has a linear dependence on that variable. And then <coughs> um, this is going to give you a Boolean 
And this for all poll is going to make sure that the polarity P2 uh, includes the information that it's uh, got a for all quantifier in it. Now, what we're going to do is translate the high level language into this um, more richly typed language um, by a process of elaboration. So remember, the high level language doesn't contain any of these linearity or polarity uh, annotations. So the first part is to elaborate the types. So we're going to have to insert extra type variables. So remember that we had this type input, which was a vector of uh, reals of size five. And now a real takes a type parameter. So we're going to have to extend uh, input with a type parameter and put that um, here. And then our uninterpreted function f, well, it's going to have to um, take an input with some annotation. <coughs> and it's going to produce a real number, again, with a different annotation. And then we're going to um, assume that this function is itself uh, linear. Um, and so that's going to give us this constraint that L1 must, if, even if L1 was constant, then the output is going to be a linear dependency on those uh, things. That allows us to elaborate types and uninterpreted functions, but also we want to elaborate definitions. And the process here is quite involved. It's basically the main part of the paper. So for each user definition, we're going to insert linearity and polarity meta variables into the type, perform type checking and type class resolution to solve them wherever possible, and then gather the remaining constraints. Then there's a, a um, sort of non-standard part where we add extra constraints to track the source level function names. This is going to be used for error messages, as I'll describe later. And then we generalize in a sort of Hindley Milner style to put unsolved constraints back into the type. So here's uh, part of that specification I showed earlier. So we have equal except at, uh, takes an index from zero to four <coughs> and two inputs and uh, tells us whether or not um, <coughs> these two inputs are equal except to that um, uh, thing, uh, that index. So the first thing we do is we extend the type with some meta variables um, where we have to add annotations. So remember input got extended with what kind of real numbers it contains and the Boolean got extended with a linearity and polarity constraint. Okay. Next, we do a type check of the body of the function. Uh, and we do this bidirectionally so that we can push the type information we give the user gave us in. And also we use meta variable insertion for the implicits. And what this leads to is um, uh, each sub expression gets typed in a certain way with um, meta variables describing the linearity and polarity of those um, sub-expressions. So here, because we had uh, an, um, a disequality constraint, this is a Boolean. And down here, we can see the constraints that were gathered. gathered. So this uh, uh, disequality, the first disequality that's annotated with a Bool 6.8, uh, gives rise to um, this first constraint, has EQ, going to compare two indexes. <coughs> and um, that will result in some Boolean. And then the other has EQ comes from the second equality. Um, the third line of constraints comes from the use of implication. And the final constraint comes from the um, use of for all. So now we've gathered the, these constraints. I've just written them at the top again. Uh, we solve them. And that reduces down to uh, where we learn that the um, whole property is going to be unquantified because there was no use, no essential use of quantifiers or no infinite quantifiers in the, um, in the property. And we just get these two constraints that the um, uh, variable seven should be the maximum of zero and one, and the variable two should be the maximum of C and seven. Now with these constraints, what we could do is generalize at this point to give a, an actual type for e equal except at. So it would take a quantify over all of the um, variables involved, and put in the two type class constraints, uh, the two max lins, and then um, put the type variables into the final type. And this would actually work. So this would, would allow us to do an analysis um, um, of the rest of the program using this type as the kind of um, full specification of this uh, function. However, this wouldn't give very good error messages because when the functions are applied, we unify the variables and we lose track of what functions are actually used. And we want to tell the user if they do mix quantifiers exactly where this happened. And what we're actually going to do is track provenance um, through the uh, type check, through the um, constraint generation process. So what we do, again, we've got this um, type with these constraints. 
And then we add extra kind of odd constraints that include the function name, and in fact, actually kind of source locations and things um, that tell us <coughs> how the types which appear in the, um, the top level type, how these, these annotations appear in the top level type, how they relate to the ones coming from inside the function. And these constraints will add provenance information to the linearity and polarity uh, annotations that we used in error messages. So now we have um, this uh, type again with these constraints, and now we generalize uh, to get the full type of this function. So this is quite complex looking uh, for a relatively simple um, specification function. But what it's saying is that these are the inputs and outputs in order to tag things and um, <laughs> the fact that uh, the final linearity will basically be the maximum of con uh, const and the two input linearities. And then if you put this all together uh, with the monotonic one from before, then we'll find out the final type is that monotonic is a Boolean property which contains linear constraints and a for all quantifier. And this means it's OK. So we've actually managed to derive a type from monotonic which proves that it is something which can be translated to an SMT solver. So from the type, the specification is linear and only uses universal quantification. So now that's good, and uh, but what if it goes wrong? What if we get a type we don't like? So how do we deal with this rejection uh, constructively? So what actually happens, and I didn't show, um, is that the linearity and polarity values are annotated with provenance. So every time we... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, use one of these type uh, uh, classes. Um, we're going to annotate it with where that type uh, class uh, constraint was generated from. So then the internal representation of the type monotonic having type bool l for all stores the fact that the for all came from the use of the actual keyword for all in um, monotonic, and the l came from the use of the unknown function f. And now this provenance information is used for returning good error messages to the user. So here's an example. Um, here's the example of the subjective thing from before. And if we do this, then we get um, this error message, which identifies precisely where um, the fact we have alternating quantifiers from the fact that there's an exists and a on, on part one. And that's when went through a Call to in range in part two, and that tells us there was a for all, uh, sorry, yeah, and then there was a for all um, in part three, which actually in the subjective function. So it pinpoints exactly where the two quantifiers are and tells you where to find them. Okay, so I'll just say this quickly the analysis is compositional, so each definition is analyzed once and summarized in its type, produces good error messages, and is also evidence generating, and that's important for the next part, which is the actual translation to SMT. So <laughs> the technique we're using to translate to SMT is called normalization by evaluation, where we normalize a specification by evaluating it in a non-standard way as syntax. So at a high level, that means the real type is interpreted as real valued expressions, not actually real numbers or, or rationals really, and the Boolean type is interpreted as Boolean valued expressions. And we actually use the linearity and polarity information to refine these interpretations. So uh, real numbers are uh, of constants or actual constants, real n are linear expressions, and real so real l are linear expressions, and real n are arbitrary expressions. <coughs> and now the primitive operations are interpreted as actual syntactic manipulation. So plus, when applied to expressions, computes the normalized um, uh, addition of the two expressions. And then therefore, a closed term of type bool l exists, for instance, is guaranteed to yield, yield an existential query with linear constraints. So there's a couple of technicalities to actually get this to work. So anyone who's implemented a uh, normalization by evaluation algorithm will know that you have to track the three variables. So all type interpretations are parameterized by linear variable context. So that's um, uh, the variables which are actually used in the specification and they must support renaming. And um, a concise way of saying this is that types are actually pre-sheaves over the category of linear variable con context. And the nice thing about knowing that types are pre-sheaves um, is that most of the rest of the interpretation now just follows using the standard interpretation of lambda calculus in the pre sheet category. So the higher order functions that this user may use and all the definitions, they just melt away because they get um, automatically compiled away. 
The second um, technicality is the fact that we can have uh, functions nested within linear expressions. And particularly, so most ST solvers can actually handle this as a um, part of their input, but technically, um, the functional constraints and the linear constraints should be um, separate. So these, and, and for Marabou, this is certainly the case that doesn't do this translation for you. So these need to be translated into separate constraints like this. So f of x plus five, and we we'll separate out the f of x with a um, spare variable. And also specifications contain if then else, and these need to be translated into Boolean logic. Now, the tricky part is that implementing these on syntax that does not support it is not possible. So if then else may occur within a linear expression, linear expressions don't have if then else. So what we need to do is kind of float these up to a context where it is possible. And so what we do is add the ability to make definitions or function lifting and to do if then else as effects that are used within the normalization by evaluation uh, procedure. So we define a monad lift with the following operations. It's got an operation for ifs, an operation for lets, so the two different kinds that we need. And then the whole interpretation becomes um, a monadic interpretation using Moji's call by value monadic translation. And then when we get a lift constraint value, so that's one that's been lift, uh, a lifted constraint, then the operations can be translated into the real ones as a logical formula. Uh, this whole procedure has been formalized in Agda, and we use our intrinsically typed nameless representation for the syntax. And we define two interpretations, one where normalization is a function which gets you a prenex formula, and also a standard semantics where we interpret as a, a property as just an Agda set. And then the final correctness uh, property is that uh, via logical relations argument, which is actually just another interpretation, we get agreement between the standard semantics and the normalized semantics. So I'm running out of time, but this is basically saying that um, the two are equally satisfiable. So for any inter uninterpreted function implementation F, um, the standard semantics, there's a, um, a back and forth translation between that set and the set we get from interpreting the formula that comes out of the normalization. So just to conclude, so the goal was to translate high level specifications into SMT solvers with good error messages and guaranteed semantic preservation. And we've given a composition analysis provenance tracking for good error messages, and I think a novel NBE procedure with the correctness proof. So the language is at this top URL and the formalization is available at the bottom URL. And future work, uh, there's still some gaps between the formalization and the real implementation to close those. The constraint solving is currently a little bit in inefficient. Uh, more importantly though, we'd like to do other SMT theories and see what, how that could work. And we think that generalizing um, the normalization procedure to other DSLs um, may be useful in particular, things like nested relational calculus, which has nested if then else's, uh, which need to be pulled out to the, the query level. Uh, that's everything I have. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Can you hear me? Oh. Uh, yes. Okay. You did not hear anything I asked. Oh, no. no. Okay. <laughs> well, let me retry then. So, um, translations from high order logics to SMT solvers can be found in tools known as hammers. And these tools are, of course, not verified, unlike your work, which is quite nice, uh, nice aspect of your work. Uh, but can you compare? The translations as such? Um. Um, so my, my understanding of the, the, the hammer-like tools is that the formula you give them must already be roughly in the um, subset that the solver handles, um, whereas we, we can deal with an input which uh, already has higher order functions and things in. So we actually handle that normalization process as well, which I guess in a hammer system is done by some preprocessor. Uh, 
um, before the actual handing over to SMT software happens, is my understanding. I'm not an expert on those tools, I have to admit. Um, okay, thank you. Other questions? I would like to come. I would like to come back to the question of uh, better error messages. Mm -hmm. um, you say that uh, you improve the error messages when the type class resolution fails. Is that it? Uh, it it's not when it, the type class resolution fails. So we've um, made the system work so that the type class resolution always succeeds. Um, it's just that it might give you the answer you're not, you don't want. So it might tell you that the property is nonlinear. And then the um, types inferred by the type class resolution actually contain the provenance information to pinpoint why that happened. And then the error message is generate from that, generated from that provenance information. Okay. So the error messages is, are produced when the type class is succeeds in a way that are predictable, predictably not what the user would want to see. Yes. And uh, in the same vein, uh, the SMT, the call to the SMT system uh, does not produce error messages. Um, <coughs> uh, so we haven't modeled that in, in the work we've done here. Um, it's actually possible from the fact that um, uh, this equi satisfiability um, uh, property. If 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 you're asking a kind of um, for all type uh, property, and what you get back from the SMT solver is uh, a counterexample, then this property will allow you to translate the counterexample uh, from the SMT solver back to the. Um, well, in principle, it allows to translate the property back uh, to the original. Um, specification. So in principle, you could then highlight the quantifiers and show where the counterexample, um, uh, what the counterexample is, but we haven't done that yet. Thank you, Robert. All right, let's thank the speaker again. And this concludes the session. Now it's time for lunch. <laughs>